Hello there, everybody, and welcome to another Kerfuffle Showcase. And I am delighted to have me, honoured to have with me here, Claire Yates. How are you, Claire? I'm very well, thank you, Simon. Very well indeed. And we're talking about yourself, but we're also talking just as interestingly about uh, Claire Yates training. So you've come back to the fold, uh, your, your old... Your old love, your old joy of training, training the, the people, the wonderful people up within this industry, haven't you? So yes. you've decided you've, you've, you've titled this once. What's different about CY training compared with other training providers? I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking through that over the over the coming months. But first and foremost, for those people that have lived under a rock, would you just introduce yourself and give a bit of background for those people that don't know you? Yes, of course. Um, so I'm a trainer with humble beginnings. So I started off um, a career in property just over 30 years ago, started out as a part-time weekend receptionist um, up in Lancashire, funnily enough, while my babies were little. And I got the bug really quickly and went from estate agency to new build, from new build to holiday cottages, and then into working live with as a panel manager. And I had the privilege of visiting over two and a half thousand estate agency branches. I think they all had donuts at the time um, as I went round. I saw round that. And... I saw, that's <laughs> a great claim. That I love the idea of just ticking these ones off as you're going going around them all. That's brilliant. Yeah. So some people will have remembered me as the donut lady back in the day, um, and it was fantastic because I learned so much about estate agency, the different areas, and how they work. Um, and so after four and a half years, I decided to um, help agents to sell more um, additional services but also I'd recognise that solicitors needed help as well. Yeah. So they wanted help on how to actually uh, form a better partnership with their estate agency referrers. So um, I started out as Claire Fletcher training back in 2002 mm. and carried on with that until about 2014. And then um, as most people do, I had a series of personal events which interfered with being self-employed. Mm. So I took some time out, went back into agency, took some properties on, did some property management and then worked for TM group, briefly selling searches to lawyers. Um, and I discovered that what I missed most of all was going and helping estate agents and lawyers. And so I'm back in training again, and I'm loving it. Excellent. Uh, and a couple of things there, John out. So first of all, uh, different referral uh, opportunities, different referral streams. Uh, should be at the at the top of everyone's list. It's it's very difficult to get right, isn't it? It's easy to yeah. dabble. I think it's it's fair to say, but to get that really ticking over, as some of us I know your clients do so successfully, uh, is is that it's it's not it's not unique by any way uh, by any means, is it? But it does need to be worked on. It can't happen accidentally. No, it needs to be worked on. The staff need to actually fully get on board with it for a start. So they have to understand the why, and they have to like the referrals where they're going to go to yeah. and they have to um, see the importance of the business and then actually it's not as straightforward as it seems sometimes they do need some help in some keywords and phrases that will help the clients to um to buy from them yeah um so that that whole process and then the solicitors equally re receiving the referrals or the ifa whichever way you're sending your work they all need to be teed up to receive those referrals in the way they're intended uh, to get that conversion rate up um, so agents that aren't converting at around 60 to 70 percent of legal referrals, definitely that's something that I can absolutely help with. That's that's a great bar as well to be getting. That's that's OK. That's good. So um, and I think that's that's a, a key element there, isn't it? You talk about. Um, taking the team with you too often the business owners for the right reasons can go with a particular supplier across any board but if they forget about the staff if you if you forget about it it never works in the way that you intended it was going to do at the outset no the hearts and minds is vital and i've seen in the last year that when the staff actually lose confidence in say a solicitor that they're referring to then their referrals are half-hearted and they're not trying as hard as they want and they're not bothered if the client doesn't say yes. So you absolutely need to get them to understand the importance, the commercial stuff, but also why it's good for the client. And there are so many reasons why it is really good for the customer to be with a solicitor that the estate agent knows, likes and trusts as well. Yeah. And it's that communication that's really key to all of this. And do you believe it is possible to be able to get the, 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 the team members, the staff members, to be able to sell these additional services as if they were, as they are, should be a benefit to the to the consumer, you know, so, so that they see it as not somebody trying to do the hard sell, but actually help them out with what is just another uh, service that they're going to need to have sorted out at some stage anyway? 
Yeah, so one of the things that I quite often say to people is in order to move, you're actually going to need the help of three professionals. Okay. Uh, you've got me and I'm going to be your fundraising. I'm going to sell your house for the highest possible price. Yep. The second person you're going to need is a, a financial advisor that's going to arrange for you to help to help you with all of those funds and what you can do with them. And the third person you need is a solicitor to arrange the transfers. Um, you can do this the hard way and run up and down the high street, mm. or you can just let me arrange it all for you. And um, and it'll be much easier for you and for everybody else concerned. It not, is that easy. Not even a few minutes in and you're already dropping gold dust, uh, uh, like, like uh, pixie dust all over the place. Fantastic. That's a really, look, what a wonderful, simplistic way of explaining it out there. And, and I can see how that would work very well with talking to, to the public. And we always forget, don't we? It's like, I don't know when we first started, it always used to be put about that people buy or sell property every six or seven years, which obviously we know now is, is way much, much longer and everything else there. The public just don't have any opportunity to get good at this unless they are investors, do they? To understand it really, not, the vast majority anyway. So we, we need to understand how we how to explain it so simplistically like that to get them on side absolutely and the other thing is it's it's for the estate agent to recognize that they're they're having a game of this from the start yeah. that they don't know if the seller can sell and they don't know if the buyer can buy yeah. and once they put the deal together they're at the mercy of those professionals so if they don't do something to influence that choice then they're left with a stranger that the that the client brings them so from a commercial point that, that's yeah. not something you'd go into normally would you uh, with a lot of confidence no but but most most people if they look at the common sense would say why am i going to leave the client who knows nothing about conveyancing or sales progression to go and choose the professionals to get me paid yeah so what, what was it specifically do then do you think really made you get back into training you said you missed the agents and the agency side of things what is it about what is it about it that, that, uh, that makes you so interested there's an incredible um, buzz that you get as a trainer when you see light bulb moments going on around the room, when people actually recognise that the person I'm talking about is them. Yeah. And I've given them a way of phrasing something to a customer that they can not only take away, but use. And then they come back to me and say, this is the difference that you've made. Um, and that's already happening. I've only been back, uh, back trading now for six months. And the feedback is already coming back to say that you've made a difference. Right. And I can't get that by selling a product or a service to anybody else, apart from happy customers generally. But when I'm training in a room and it's agency specific and it's geography specific, so I get their market, yes. then then the, the, the feeling that I get of being part of that company is irreplaceable, even if it's just for a day. So I get that. So I, I can, I'm all over that. So we've just finished, obviously, EA Masters a couple of days ago. And that wonderful thing where you see clients of yours or friends of yours winning those awards up on the stage. And it's, you know, it's just it, 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 just to be able to, be, you know, get that halo effect, just to be there, to be pleased for them is a wonderful, it's, it's, it is a wonderful payback, isn't it? It is. Um, so, yeah, watching sort of new, uh, new negotiators suddenly saying, so that's why we do it. Yeah. Um, to get to to get value was going. I thought I knew it all, um, but the actually I didn't. Was, the slightly cynical ones that were like, you know, sat there at the start of the training session like this, and then they warm up and then come come round to it. That yeah, that can that that, that must work, must work go go down would go down very well. And again, going back to that fact, you know, all of that the donut tour as you called it. Uh, there's not a part of the marketplace or dare I say part of the country really that you don't know pretty well, is there? You know, no, you know, I, no. players, you'll know the you know the the intricacies of those individual marketplaces. Yeah, I had a small patch to cover for live. I covered from um, Penzance to uh, Newcastle upon Tyne and Ipswich to Fishguard, so right. it was totally doable. You know, totally manageable. But yeah, I've had the joy of working with some of the very best estate agents, both within that panel job, but also as a freelance. And and you learn from every single agent. I never stop learning. Yeah. Um, there was a great phrase that a young negotiator taught me the other day. And I said, how do you ask an open question to get the conversation started? And she just says, what's the plan? Oh, no, yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> Can I ask you this question? How much is understanding the end game, what you, you know, what you're, what you're aiming towards and how much is it, is the importance in specific scripts? And you've, you, I mean, you've just said something there that is a wonderful phrase that can't, can't help. So there definitely is validity in learning these things, but, but you know, is, is it just a balance of that, of trying to get there without it having to be too scripted or is there still a real importance to learn these key phrases? 
I think some key phrases will always help you. Some go-to open questions are just perfect so that when you're struggling to get the client to really converse with you, that you've got these questions to the side. But I think once you really master the art of uh, conversation, because that's what we do, then actually it starts to come naturally and you don't need them. Yeah. But it's it's always good to have them. Even I have a couple of notes just to prompt me um, every so often. I can't literally ad lib all the way through. Um, but I think also if they if they hear the words and they sound genuine and real, then it's very quick for them to start to put them into their vocabulary and off they go. Yeah. Yeah. OK. And are there some people, are there, clearly there are, but are the vast majority of people coachable, trainable or... Are, are there literally some that just <laughs> are beyond helping? There are a few that are beyond helping. Um, and in most oh, cases... Name them, name them. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, mainly their egos get in the way. Yeah, that okay. they, don't, they don't believe that they, yeah. they can be taught any more about the business, that they, they think that what they're doing is really good and they're so busy congratulating themselves that they forget that they're only as good as yesterday. Do that, those ones, I would take it, though, that, that wouldn't normally be the, the guys at the top of it, because why would they get you in if they thought we know everything? So that will be people more junior in an organisation that really are almost feeling a bit begrudged being brought to the training session. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't ask to come. I don't think I should be here. That usually is the start. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, quite often, <laughs> I'm quite often warned about them before I go in the room. Just to let you know, he's going to be a little bit <laughs> difficult. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Yeah, um, I guess the, the key thing with them is getting them to, to that the most important one there is self-awareness, isn't it? And it, it's a difficult challenge. But if you can break through there and let them know just because this is the way you've always done things does not mean that there are other options. Yeah. You know, even if they don't take everything on board, if they can take a, a, a couple of uh, bits out of the session, that's still got to be a win, hasn't it? Yeah, I think the most interesting thing has been that the pandemic has caused people to lose their way a bit. Mm. Um, I mean, value is in particular under enormous pressure to bring an instruction home when there's a shortage of property. Um, and the tried and tested methods of, that they used to use in a slightly easier market are, are not necessarily working now. Mm. So there's a little bit of self-doubt breaking out. And I think that applicants are becoming more demanding as well. And so the straightforward, let me put you on the mailing list, which is an old fashioned phrase, isn't it now? Yeah. Um, uh, these things aren't quite working. So I think when people go in and say, let's go and take a helicopter ride over the business and I'm not going to teach you to suck eggs, but just let's go back to basics. Why are we doing it? Who are we doing it for? And what's the end result? Then most people start to sit down and quite enjoy it because we, we're sort of pulling it together and then putting it back together. <laughs> Isn't that, um, my perception is that People have always taught the talk, haven't they? Lots of business, you'll be more than aware of this. Loads of business said, oh, we absolutely believe in training and development. It's critical to us. Th there's a downturn in the market and boom, there goes the training budget as the first thing. So they, don't, yeah. they just don't practice what they preach. I mean, clearly the, the, the gap between good, uh, the, the best and the rest, I believe is getting more and more. And I mean, those good ones are just doubling down. What I think is really interesting now, though, is there there is a real keenness from the individuals themselves to self-develop, aren't they? Yes. And, and I think that has to has to be quite positive for us as well as an industry, but also for you guys as trainers that there some of these people will be asking, you know, we used to have Claire Yates at our previous company. Can we get her back in? Because that's fantastic. And we learn so much from her. You, you must hear that on an ongoing basis quite regularly. Yeah, that, that's that's true. And I think the other thing is that those people are actually writing my next courses. So a company that I just work with has specifically wanted their uh, uh, new um, ambitious the, the newer recruits the ambitious guys to feel that the only route wasn't necessarily valuer to be a valuer yes. and so they asked me to write a course on what a valuer does on a daily basis the pressures the highs the lows right. so that they could make a much more informed decision as to which direction they went yeah. but we also talked about the other key roles in agency and where you could still forge a career and be highly successful and that's to drive that that ambition that want to be better yeah. And so a lot of what I try and build in is a bit of personal development about what are you reading? What are you doing for your own personal development? It can't all come from the business. Yeah. I talk about what I read and what inspires me. Yeah. Um, and that, that's, that's definitely helping. But there isn't, I don't have a library, well, I do have a library of courses that I can 
trot out to people. But the thing that excites me the most is when I'm asked to write new stuff. Yeah. Um, and I'm doing a lot of that. So I've got a management commercial awareness course now um, for branch managers and stuff like that. That's that's a client that's asked me to do that. So, so, so I was going to ask you, you know, how do you go and choose the topics of your of your core programs? It is just naturally from feedback from from the from from your clients yourselves. Look, yeah, we're going back to them saying, what how what can I help you with? And as every good company should, you listen to your clients, don't you? Yeah, and they tell me the outcome they're looking for, and I write the program around that outcome. So, um, and I always check back and say, is the content appropriate? You're happy with this? And um, they sometimes supply me with some local stats to help me to make sure that I'm talking about their area and not some part of Oxfordshire where I live. Um, so it has to be appropriate to their marketplace. But above all, they tell me what the challenge is, whether it's internal staff retention, um, staff uh, personal development, or whether it's external in terms of brand reputation and five-star customer service. Excellent. Okay, and, and look here today. I can announce, can I? I think in kind of a super signing, like uh, they do in football, when somebody signs a, a Lionel Messi. We're really pleased to be having you coming on board with us with campus, aren't we? So yes, you'll be going to be able to see some of your some of your fantastic content. I've already I've seen the topics in there, and I, yeah, I couldn't be more excited. So again, thanks for thanks for joining our own version of Netflix to try and drive standards up across the board. So we couldn't be any happier with that. Um, and also, could you just then give us an idea about what is your typical client? And not just what's your typical client, what, what sort of client gets you most excited when you have a conversation you think, oh, I can really get my hands in, in, you know, I can really get involved with this? It's really difficult to say that because I've trained single branch, large single branch agencies up to um, mega <laughs> agencies. Um, I would say that probably my... Uh, Ideal client tends to be sort of three, three to ten branches where um, there's a real diversity in terms of each branch has got its own local challenges. Uh, each valuer, if they went across to another one, wouldn't automatically succeed without learning a bit about it. Um, they've got they've got a desire to bring their staff on, not just keep where they're going, and they want to hear what the feedback is from the courses, what the staff are also looking to learn. So it, it's but I've got a couple of meaty projects which are being tabled at the moment, and one of them involves um, a transition to managing their own panel, which is quite exciting. And that will involve training law firms as well as agents. And, and that's where you come into your absolutely unique, isn't it? Because you've been on both sides of the of the divide, haven't you? And yeah. let's face it, it shouldn't be, but it is a divide a lot of the time, isn't it? So to bring those two working in tandem, yeah, that's a great angle, isn't it there? Yeah, so that that that's the sort of thing that I just get so excited about because it it's it's diverse, it's different, and it it plays to obviously my strengths and knowledge, but also I love doing all the research yeah. and and putting it all together, um, making sure that there's lots of laughter in the room. That's another thing that's key to me. I always joke and say the biggest idiot in the room will be me. I will fall over equipment and oh, stumble yeah, over my words. On that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, so, I yeah. there is, what I get there, though, Claire, as well, is you those 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 wonderful uh, sort of mid-sized businesses as well, where keeping the consistency of services is absolutely critical, isn't it? So yeah. often when you go into them, you'll have some absolutely high-flying offices, but you'll have others for whatever reason they've lost a manager or just the uniqueness of their of their own marketplace. And that ain't great, isn't it? When you're looking at that as a helicopter view, you need to bring the the, the more you know float them all, float the boat, isn't it? Is is the approach to try and bring everyone because other otherwise that 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 can just lead to a very different service, and that's not great from a business point of view. No, and I think the other thing is that with um the medium size, the sort of smaller to medium sized businesses, it's very easy to work with the um, senior management team because they're all behind it. You haven't got anybody who's acting um, in a negative way, shall we say, you know, a troublemaker, because everybody has agreed that this is what we're going to do. So once I've walked out of the room, they're going to positively enforce all of the training messages, because I can't work a miracle in one day or two or three days. Yeah. It needs to be it needs to be embedded into the company's um, practice and, and culture. So, so working with a slightly smaller businesses rather than the the big boys enables me to make it personal for everybody there. 
how, how long does that kind of getting to know you, if, if, you were, if you were a tech company, they would call that an onboarding process. How long does it take you to get the, the, a, a good feel for what the company is and, and where you can help them out? Probably about two or three conversations initially with the senior management team. And depending on where the firm is located, I'll start to do a bit of mystery shopping as well, just to make sure that the image that the senior management team of the business is the same one that I get because um, sometimes it isn't I, now I mean, and again often when, often when you talk to the the people within the business and they and they say you know but they'll probably look around as they do it. they said they said what they said we were like that that's just not how we are at all isn't it they can yeah. there can be a, a no and often nobody has the heart to tell the senior management that's how it is yeah exactly so yeah two or three um sort of meetings conversations just to make sure that i'm a right fit for them and they're a right fit for me and there's no point in promising to do something for a company that I know I can't achieve. So I'll never, I'll never make promises I can't keep. But if I do deliver, it's a matter of personal pride that they get what they want at the end. Absolutely great. So, so um, I mean, I've seen, as I said, some of the what, standard courses that you do, which are you know absolutely fantastic. Do you, you, I take it from what you were intimating earlier, you can do bespoke courses though as well. Yeah, I love doing bespoke. Um, there's very little that I wouldn't lend my hand to except compliance because okay. compliance sends me to sleep. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're more similar than, than I, I mean, I know we liked a glass of Sauvignon Blanc, but uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, compliance is, is, is not my thing either on that one. Okay. How, how do you, is that again, just having a conversation with you seeing and you go away and then say, actually, I can, I can put this together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I put a set of skeleton together of, of what I think should be in it. And then just check back that I'm on the right course because it will take a bit of writing. If it's a really meaty course, then I may have to make a charge to a firm for some course preparation as well as the actual delivery because it can sometimes take me two or three days to put something together. But as far as I'm concerned, it's um, it's getting it right. And if I get a raving fan, then that makes a huge difference to my business because the referrals and recommendations come in. Absolutely makes sense. Um, what do you what do you perceive as being some of the biggest challenges at the moment out there in a agency? From who would benefit most from from uh, from which courses you do? That's a really good one. So going back into the training room and getting some honesty from everybody. One of the things I'd love to get right is applicant management. Okay. Um, and I think the applicant right now, because there's so many of them and there's hardly any property, are not being treated terribly well by the industry. No. And I have a feeling that many of them are going back and telling their parents, their mates about how they were treated as unimportant, not interesting to anybody. And having got two sons who've just bought their houses in the last three years and how important it is to them that they've got somebody they can talk to. I think we're making a huge error in either over promising, asking people to go on the system for no purpose other than just to take data. That's mad. Um, and look, you know my you know my previous background, but we've got a lot to a lot to answer for because you can actually, I'm sure you, uh, if you've been in that many agencies, you can almost tell which computer package they use by the way that they register it and the questions they ask because yeah. they're literally following it in a kind of computer says no regimented system that does not give you that kind of the, the empathy you need to be getting across at that vital first moment, is, is it? Now they're terrible conversations. And the other thing is that nobody actually explains to the applicant what they're going to get by being on the system. The, so honest, the, honest, the, the first thing we need to sort out is that hideous phrase, applicant. You know, yeah. you know, what I have to apply for a property. And that, as you said, that's almost how it feels at the moment, doesn't it? Oh, it, it's, it's awful. But, you know, the, the honest approach for somebody who's just looking is to say to them, there's no point in taking your details at this stage because until you're actually ready, there's not much I can do, but the portals provide a brilliant service and yeah. you can set up alerts. And in many cases, you're gonna get, get that first. And I think a bit of honesty, but I, um, talking to some of the negotiators, they hadn't really understood why everybody was going on the system. They just got used to doing it. Yeah. So the moment that you start asking a question, they're going, do we have your details? And off they go. So yes. it's a terrible conversation. Yeah. And vendors, I mean, that's a lovely, another lovely phrase. Yeah. The rest of the property industry has dropped the phrase vendor, but we've still got it. And um, what's one of those? <laughs> yeah, it's staggering, isn't it? And again, all of these phrases just puts that level of 
distance between you and your ultimate your end your end client, which is is never is never great in any industry, is it? I think Kate Faulkner summed it up. I think we just need to go back to our role is to help people put roofs over their heads and also to help people move. Yeah. And if we go back to focused on on the customer, uh, the business will follow because all we're doing is we should. And there's another phrase, Peter Knight, dollar productive activity yes, is what I'm doing right now going to generate any revenue for the business. Because and if the answer is no, then stop. You can be bad busy, can't you? We're, in fact, I would argue that most people's jobs are actually, you know, they might feel like they put in a shift and they probably have, they're exhausted. But has it actually been, you know, has it actually delivered on anything? And that's that's the critical element, isn't it, there? What are the big no-nos, uh, uh, Claire, in terms of training? What what mistakes do you see delivered by businesses out there in this, in this area? The JFDI approach. Uh, just... That's I'll do just, it. Get on with it. Yeah. Nearly called my training business that. Um, JFDI, uh, this whole idea that you look, I've told you to do it and I'll do it without the understanding of why. Yeah. There has to be a proper, easy to understand process that the staff recognize so that when they go off process, they can see what happens. You know, they just, it's not, I don't think our business is clear. To understand so so for businesses not to to sit down and say have you thought about doing this or this would work really well i think there's just people are left all day long just mindlessly doing that and, and i think that when you've got a branch manager that's a valuer and is out all day which is frequently the case they're not there to supervise to listen to conversations that staff are having with with people and to coach on the spot yeah. So bad habits creep in really quickly and very hard to get rid of once they're there. So um, for me, for businesses just to actually just stop and start listening to what their staff are doing and saying, they could make huge changes without even spending a penny on me. I didn't say that, but, but that's where it starts. Do you actually know what conversations are taking place? What changes or trends do you think there uh, has, has happened because of the pandemic in training and development? And do you think they're here to stay? Well, some of it, I hope not, because my happy place is in a training room, not doing Zoom. No. And, and I was horrified the other day because I saw a girl who got her screen on and she was listening to a, an online training course. She was muted, camera off. She's just walking around the office making cups of coffee so she could tick a box to say, yeah, I attended that yes. hour session. Um, I think that Zoom, it's very easy for us to cut off and not listen to everything that's going on. Whereas when you're in a truly interactive discussion with people, you tend to learn more. Yeah. Um, so Zoom is great for, I think, for um, learning the technicalities of the business, the basics. But the uh, the real psychology stuff, I think, still needs to be done. But you want to be in the room. You want to be able to feel it because sales is a famously a people person business. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think some of the, the, the positives are that we don't have to do as much as we did. We don't have to mm. be present as much. I think flexible working needs to come in so we retain some really talented staff who find the hours, quite frankly, um, terrifying when you've got kids. And I, I don't think being a parent should stop you being a great agent. So um, I think that we can learn a lot from looking at how other businesses and we have to respect the fact that our clients have taken time to know more and they become more knowledgeable every year. Yeah. So we have to start to respect them and not keep implying that we practice a dark art that they'll never understand. Because unfortunately, just trust me, uh, I'll take you through this. Yeah, uh, that's really interesting. I think, yeah, for me, Zoom, it feels like, um, uh, you know, it, it's great once you've got the relationship, you know, you can you, you can connect almost just as easily. Uh, any of us who've had kind of in lockdown, we kind of had the drinks parties. It was it, sometimes you'd forget there, but that initial connection and for the important ones to be in the room is still still best practice, as they would say, wouldn't they? Well, yeah, and I think it's being able to watch everybody, because for me as a trainer, I watch their body language and I can spot if somebody's not saying anything. Yes. When you're just talking to a laptop and occasionally you might see a little person's uh, camera lighter, it's really, really difficult to supervise and to include everyone. So I think certainly the best successes um, for me happen when people take time out of the business to be somewhere else where all they've got to do is learn rather than be staring at the screen on their at their desk that's 
not great. Yes. Okay. Cool. And and you know, I mean, we spoke about a whole host of different things you enjoy, but what do you love best about your job? Um, um, oh gosh, that's such a tough one to ask. Answer. As I said to you, I think I love meeting new people, and I do every day. And I love learning about business. I love delighting people. I like. I, obviously, I'm a people pleaser. So there's nothing that that gives me a bigger buzz than than to be. Um, to be given a big thank you and the feedback that is good. But I think at the end of the day, I'm not just a people pleaser, I love to help people. And to know that I've made a difference means I sleep at night with a big smile on my face and it just feels fab. So I always want to be helping people and certainly having sold a product for the last four and a half years, which was tough and having to try and get that conversation started and then really sell hard. Um, being able to do something where I feel I'm making a bigger difference now is just so rewarding but you've got as we said before you you were crossing that divide with the conveyancing side obviously you're understanding the agency side understanding the, the prop tech side of things that's a that's three very strong elements to what makes property uh tick isn't it yeah um, and relevance yes and and i actually think that if we start to go back to i suppose some old-fashioned things which was there was a collaboration between a lawyer and a state agent and a financial advisor and the surveyor. And we seem to have lost that. Yeah. And I'm really keen to bring that sense that we have one client and we have to work together to help that one client move. We've all been engaged with for the same purpose. Yeah. And I think we've started to sort of throw a hot potato around and just blame people for things that aren't going right. Well, and if I've got that's just if I got, the wider world, isn't it, really? Unfortunately. Yeah. You know. But if I've got one wish, it was that we'd start to, to work together as, um, as an industry that helps people move and to respect each person's skill set and technical ability. If it doesn't work well, then let's go and have a Zoom call. We don't yeah. have to go. I mean, it's still nice to go for a pint with a solicitor on a Friday night, but you could have a virtual pint with them yeah. at any time and just say, we need to talk about, we need to talk about Simon. We need to talk about whoever it is. Um, and let's just talk about the client. How can we best serve this client instead of you're not doing your job, whoever it is? Because I think that's that's not helping us. So I, that to me is going to be a big thing to, to change. And that, you know, you were talking before how put you going into it like that with those key parties. When everyone's fate is determined by the success of it happening, it's just so short termist not to work towards that anyway, isn't it? Yeah. And unprofessional to slag other people off, regardless of what they do, because it, it doesn't sound good to the client that you're not taking responsibility sounds so petty doesn't it it just um, yeah you know, sort of like you know don't ask me hey yeah. it's a legal problem isn't it you know exactly right, <laughs> exactly right. which businesses do you uh, i appreciate this is a bit unfair because you deal with so many but over the years or uh, at the moment which businesses do you particularly uh, admire around uh, the industry at the moment so um Bizarrely enough, I was standing in Ryder and Dutton offices when they made the announcement that they okay. were um, joining Manning Stainton. Um, so Manning Stainton and Ryder and Dutton are two incredible firms and now proper Northern powerhouse that I'm really privileged to have worked with with both of those. I had, um, I had, I had King of the North, Mark Manning, sat next to me at EA Masters. So I was just I was just tugging my fall up to him. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, two great businesses, which is obviously fantastic from Ryder and Dutton and, and, and something really, something unique we haven't seen in the North, has it? A, a, a chancellor size, size business really dominating that mid, middle patch now, that M62. Yeah, and some really funny links because my family tree goes back to Leeds and my kids were born in Lancashire. Uh, so it's all a bit, um, it's you know, it's a bit spooky, the whole connection proper, proper, thing. Proper red rose, white rose stuff going on there, though, isn't there? Uh, Absolutely. Um, DB Roberts, um, fantastic, innovative um, firm in the shop, in Shropshire, constantly challenging me to ask and to write new stuff. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Um, I've worked with um, experts in property down in the southwest. Um, I've, I, I know that I've been so privileged to work with so many fantastic firms over the years. And each one of them has got something quite unique they want to achieve. I'm a huge admirer of Sarah Mains up in Newcastle. She's a dear friend now. Um, there's just so many brilliant, well, brilliant know, businesses. It was, it was it was a bit of a free hit, isn't it? Because actually, it's just such a fantastic, interesting industry with so many characters uh, in, in it as well. Um, I said at the beginning, Claire, Claire that you would uh, not. You, you, there was no reason you have to give a discount because actually, there's you're worth every penny. But I begged and, and and you didn't like seeing a grown man cry, so you did say for 
uh, you'd do a special deal for some of our kerfuffle members if they were going to come for you. Would you just give us just an overview of how that's going to work? Yeah, so um, for anybody that comes through kerfuffle uh, to me for training, for the first 20 customers, I'm going to give 10% discount off their fees. So Beautiful. Thank you very much for thinking of our of our wonderful kerfufflers on that basis. So don't waste your time, guys. As soon as you see this, get on the phone. Go to CY uh, Training on, on uh, kerfuffle.com. See uh, the fantastic landing pages that we build there. See a bit more information. There's a contact us button. Or else, Claire, where, where else can they find you online? Um, so my website is cytraining.works. Um, I've got a LinkedIn page, and I've also got a Twitter page. I'm at Trainer Claire as well so uh, you can find me in any of those ways but cytraining.works is my um, website perfect and just mention your kerfuffle obviously to, to, to make sure you, you uh, get that special deal as well yeah please mention kerfuffle of course claire that we're going to be obviously talking to each other very, very much so over the coming weeks and months not least because of campus as we mentioned before our, our platform there uh, I, I can't wait to, to, to get into more detail with you as we obviously see CY training develop as inevitably it's going to do fantastically well thank you Simon thank you so much and I'll have a great one cheers thank you very much bye okay bye